Jedi. Yeah, crown me king, tell them he didn't Shalom, me king. and welcome to another edition tell here Trump on the Genesis 49 page, where crown we say no to vague interpretation king. and we give thorough breakdowns. Shalom, I'm back, but never moving backwards. Here to put Israel on the atlas. Y'all know the slogan? We say no to vague interpretations and we give thorough breakdowns. Today's topic is going to be on the tribe of Asher. Now, a lot of camps and a lot of different proponents go against the 12 tribes chart and the vision that the native Indians and the Negroes were Israelites. So this whole series, I already got it on, got one for the uh, tribe of Issachar, right? This whole series is going to give validity to those claims because we have been called dogmatic. We have been called a lot of different things. A lot of statements have been made against this chart saying that we can't substantiate it. So we're going to show the naysayers that we can substantiate it. Now, do I agree or believe that the chart needs to be reconfigured? Yes, I fully agree. I fully agree. Uh, I will expound on one uh, change that we should make. One change we should make is Naphtali and Asher. Instead of giving those country names for Asher and the country names for Naphtali, just say Naphtali are the native Indians that reside on the Andean mountain range. So the whole Inca empire on the Andean mountain range will be Naphtali. And how I deduce that is from the scriptures where it says that they would depart their lives in the high mountainous areas. And they were also called a hind. A hind is a mountainous deer. That's how I deduce that. And also, if you look at the Incas, their forefather was called Chanapata, right? Chanapata, with the rule of admiss admissibility, you can drop a... Uh, um, consonant from the end of a word so instead of napatali you get napata right so we're going to get into it we're going to give you the sources the source material you know how genesis 49 is gets down we're going to show you exactly where we're getting this information from so if anyone questions you about it you're able to show them show and prove and demonstrate your points not just proclaim show and prove and demonstrate your points and also i'm providing these sources that israel may look further and deeper into these topics to expound on it with more source material with more with more jewels add your jewels and your input to increase the knowledge on these topics my channel is built to encourage research research okay i know a lot of our camps and a lot of our ideologies discourage research because we want to we want to be dogmatic we want to stick to one thing but we have to expound our minds and grow so here we, get, here we have it, the tribe of Asher, breakdown of the South American Indians. First slide, Oscura. Oscura in uh, Espanol means dark, right? So it says the Indian tribes of Brazil, when the Portuguese first came to their country, had legends to the effect that their first ancestors had come from a land in which the other inhabitants were black. So right here, we have a source stating that these native Indians came from a black race. And the source is the Great Migration by Jeremy Fitzgerald Lee, page 64. And to the right, you have the Toronto manuscript where you can see this great black chief and a point of origin for these native Indians. Because you, you have a farce saying that, oh, these native Indians are mongoloid or they're not Negroid. But if you look at their oral history, and their artifacts, and their drawings, their frescoes, you can clearly see that they descend from dark-skinned people. So you can throw that doctrine in the trash. Next slide. Again, another source. Native black race in South America. Notice it says native, native black race in South America. So anyone says, oh, they're all mongoloids. They're ignoring the mountain and piles of resources and history that verifies that these lands were inhabited by a dark-skinned race as well. Native black race in South America. There are found spread from Guyana to Choco and denominated Guaran, Iraros, Waro, 
who are quite as black and as ugly as the black race in Africa. Why do they say ugly? Because, of course, Europeans probably wrote this, so they look at that color as being ugly. And they can, well, we know black is equated with beauty in the scriptures. And the comparison of their language and traditions enables us to trace their origin to that continent. And this is from the Annals of Iowa, volume six through seven. So we, we, we brought two sources showing that they come from black people. And keep in mind that they can trace, they can trace this race through the traditions to Africa, because we're going to make a point on that later. Next point, Chile, a town and valley named Chile. Alternately, Chile may derive from the Quechua word chin or the Ayamaran to Chile, meaning snow. Another theory favors the Mapuche word Chile, possibly meaning where the land ends or the deepest point of the earth or seagulls. I want to focus on the deepest point of the earth and where the land ends. Latino in history by Michael Norix. Now, what we just read, the Mapuche word Chile means the, the, where the land ends or the end of the earth. Deuteronomy 33 verse 17 says, His glory is like the first length of his bullock. Now, if you don't know what Chile is, Chile is in Southwest America. In South America, right? His glory is like the first thing of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorn, horns representing power and leadership and structure. With them, he should push the people together to the ends of the earth. What is this letting you know? This is letting you know the history. The, the ten tribes did not stay in captivity forever. Some people think the ten tribes just stayed in captivity. No, they got power. They became powerful, and they revolted in 612 BC and freed themselves. Okay? Now, that's a whole nother video. They freed themselves in 612 BC. They didn't stay under the tutelage of the Assyrians. They didn't stay under the tyranny of the Assyrians. They were able to free themselves. One of those reasons they were able to free themselves is because they didn't have a weapon outlaw, meaning a captive could carry weapons. And that led to their downfall. A lot of the Northern Kingdom, the House of Qumri, and the Assyrian tablets, they were able to fight for their freedom. And the book of Micah explains that. Okay, Micah 5. It says, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim. So we know it's talking about Ephraim. And they are the thousands of Manasseh. So Ephraim was going to lead the tribes. And Ephraim has the ten tribes behind them. Okay, Ephraim consists of the ten tribes. They were going to lead the tribes together to the ends of the earth. Okay, and this is making reference to America. Again, here we go. Another reference to America. Deuteronomy 33, verse 28. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. This can only be America because all the rest of the continents were known. Africa was known. Europe was known. The Middle Eastern area was known. China was known. All those areas were being populated at the time. So we know those places were known. A place to dwell safety alone would be America. America fits the criteria. Further proof to exemplify our point is the Sumerian artifacts that you find in Bolivia. Sumerian artifacts in Bolivia with cuneiform written inside of these bowls. To the left we have the source that says after a careful examination of the Fuente Magna Linear strip expert Dr. Clyde A. Winters determined that it was probably Proto-Sumerian. Now that's what that's put you in Mesopotamia in the Middle East, where we say these native Indians come from, which is found on many artifacts from Mesopotamia. An identical strip was used by the Elamites called Proto-Elamite. So these people have to come from that region, and we've been telling you that these people are Israelites. And it makes perfect sense because they, the last dynasty that they were under was the Assyrians. So it makes sense that they would have some form of Proto-Sumerian or Cuneiform. And this can be found in the Museo de los Metales Preciosos de Bolivia. Assyria. 2 Kings 17 verse 6. In the ninth year of Hoshea the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria 
and placed them in Hala and in Habar by the river of Gozan in the cities of the Medes. This also fulfills Deuteronomy 28, 68, because they, they were carried across the waters according to 2nd Ezra 13, 40 through 48. This explains the proto-Sumerian strip that we find in Bolivia. You wouldn't find these artifacts if these people didn't come from that region of the earth. Mesopotamia, Ebonati, okay? So we have solidified proof that they came from that region. Now we're going to analyze the children of Asher. Because so we're breaking down the tribes of Asher, right? We, we found out that what? They were originally Negroid people. We found out that the word Chile uh, relates to ends of the earth, which relates to Deuteronomy 33 and 17, that America or the Americas is being described in the book of 30, Deuteronomy 33 and 28 as well, a place of safety where Israel can dwell in safety and be alone. Now let's examine the children names of Asher, the Benai of Asher. Jehuba or Yekuba means hidden. Strong's H36 and 10. Shemer or Shemar means preserve. Strong H8105. Pika, Pispa means disappearance. Strong H6462. Pasach or Pasak means cut off or to divide. Strong H6457. And if you want to write all these down, you can pause the video now so you can take these notes. And you can look up the Strong's Hebrew yourself. And you can find these names, these particular names, for these four children in 1 Chronicles 7, 30-34. And that's the Benai of Asher, or the sons of Asher, right? And you, you look at these names, hidden, preserved, disappearance, cut off, and divide. This is letting you know what's going to happen to the posterity of Asher. So it says Brazil has the most uncontacted tribes in the world. Uncontacted tribes will be what? Hidden. They will be preserved. They will disappear. They will cut off and be divided. So it fits those children. The Benai of Asher or the sons of Asher prognosticate the future of his posterity. Nomen omens. Through the children you can see their future. Hidden, preserved, disappearance, cut off and divide. Brazil has the most uncontacted tribes in the world. So we make that analogy with the scripture. We use the scripture as the barometers to identify these people. Brazil, you can see, to this day, uncontacted tribes are still being discovered. So it fits those names. Hidden, preserved, disappearance, cut off, divided, separated. Asher, Brazil's Amazon is home to more uncontacted tribes than anywhere in the world. So anybody confused where these people are? The general population would be located in Brazil or in South America. There are thought to be at least 100 isolated groups in this rainforest. According to the government's Indian Affairs Department, FUNAI, their decision not to maintain contact with other tribes and outsiders is almost certainly a result of previous disastrous encounters and the ongoing invasion and destruction of their forest home. Source www.survivalinternational.org You had the rubber boom, you had the invasion by the, by the Portuguese, the French that created what, what, what is called Bush Nigui. Bush Nigui are, are people that fled their homes and their villages into the Amazon River and into the forests or the jungle if you will to escape Spanish invasion, to escape the rubber boom. So they fit, again, the names. Hidden, Yacuba was hidden, preserve, they're cut off, they're divided, and disappearance. That's why they're uncontacted. A lot of these tribes, people don't even know exist. So they fit the posterity. And remember, I called these people, look, I labeled them what? Asheri. These are the Asheri people. And here we go. In the handbook of South American Indians, the tropical forest tribes, you have the name Asheri as an Indian group. Asheri is Hebrew for the Asherites, the people of Asher. Why are we finding this in Brazil? Why are we finding this name? 
and this Indian group in South America. You want to know why? Because these people are Israelites. The indigenous people are Israelites. They came over here on ships. There's a hundred native Indian tales of them sailing over here on ships from the east. But you insist to keep perpetuating a lie that they came on the Bering Strait, on a land bridge or an ice bridge that's negative 40 degrees below. That's a fairy tale. Reality is they came on ships. Who are these people? The children of Israel. That's who they are. Barzil, meaning iron in Hebrew. It says, the Serra dos Carajas, one of the most largest iron deposits in the world. Iron ore is the world's second biggest commodity, cargo after crude oil. And Vale Sa, based on Rio de Janeiro, is the biggest producer, accounting for about 31% of global iron ore exports. Deuteronomy 33 verse 25. So these people fit the prophecy. They fit the scriptures. And we have sources to back that up. And solidify. And make it concrete. That these are the children of Asher. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. And as thy days so, so shall thy strength be. Why? Because they're walking on those resources. Because iron is in the ground, brass is in the ground. And you can see the Serra dos Carajas is one of the most largest iron deposits in the world. So Brazil has been flooding the export market with iron. And it's ironic because the word Barcel in Hebrew means iron. Oil. In 2007, Petrobras, the state oil company and partners, made the biggest oil find in the Western Hemisphere in 30 years. And you can see the company Petro Petrobras, and this goes with the prophecy of him dipping his foot in oil, which we're going to get. Brazil sugar. Bra Brazil produced almost 720 million metric tons of sugar cane in 2010, more than two and a half times that of the second largest producer, India. About 55% of it went into ethanol production, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Genesis 49 verse 20. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. So we can see that they're fitting these scriptures so far. The royal dainties could be sweet, or it can be, it, it can encompass a lot of things, but I want to focus on the sugar cane production because there's so much coming out of Brazil. They're only second, they're second to India. So again, the Barakim, the blessings of Asher, Deuteronomy 33, verse 24. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Now, we know the highest concentration of Negroes in the Western Hemisphere is in Brazil. It says, let him be acceptable to his brethren. Why? Because a lot of those uncontacted tribes are uncivilized. And let him dip his foot in oil. And we just explained the oil. Okay, so these are the blessings in Deuteronomy 33 regarding Asher in the last days. Oil, again, the proven oil reserves in Venezuela are recognized as the largest in the world, totaling 297 billion barrels. And you can see the list here, right? At number one, ranked at the top is Venezuela. Saudi Arabia is not the top. It's number two. Venezuela in South America, where the children of Asher reside, is number one. Venezuela is number one in the world. This is facts, people. This is not fabrication. This is all facts. Again, the reason why I pose these slides right here is because you have a lot of people that say, oh, one West made up these Indians being Israelites. Before there was one West, before 1969, before the 1980s and the seven, seven elders and REI, them Indians wasn't calling themselves Israelites. B.S. La Iglesia Israelita del Nuevo Pacto Universal. 
a group of native Indian Israelites who started ever since 1955. So before there was a thing called One West, you had Israelites in South America. Started by Ezekiel Atukusi Gamanal, Indios de Hebreos. So before there was a One West, there was Indians teaching that they were Israelites. So you can kill that and throw that in the trash. You can discard that foolish argument now. And here's more proof. Now, this is going into Mexico, but I also want to bring this up because it's from a book called Jews of the Amazon by Arias Segal, page 138 to 139. It says, in 1950, Israeli anthropologist Rafael Patai published the first study on the 50 practicing Jews of Venta Prieta. Based on three-month field research that he con con conducted in 1948, this is way before One West, the scholar described a small congregation of Christians who claimed to be descendants of Moranos. And there were a few even claimed to come from the lost tribes of Israel. So they were even claiming, claiming to be Moranos, meaning Sephardim, Sephardim, or Sephardic Jews, or they were claiming to be the lost tribe of Israel. So that doctrine or that way of thinking was being taught long before there was one West. Whether the Jews of Venta Prieta come from an old tribe, from Jewish ancestors, or a new tribe in the midst of the Jewish people does not change the fact they feel themselves to be a remnant of Israel. So again, before there was anything called One West, they were teaching this. Jews of the Amazon by Ariel Sagala, page 138-139. More proof. Again. The claims are legit. Hence, hence as modern-day Moranos, the Jewish mestizos are neither a lost tribe or a new one. Rather, they are authentic descendants of Jews, a pedigree that most of them can prove. Source, Jews of the Amazon by Adia Segal, page 146, because a lot of those native Indians descend from Sephardim, a Sephardic Jews, and they can prove it. And we know the Sephardic Jews were legitimate Jews that were black. Majority of them were dark skinned. They were always regarded as swarthy. Okay, the Jews of Spain and Portugal. The, the, the Jews of Portugal, especially, were all known as black. Baruch Spinoza has a description of his skin. His skin color is black. And they said they all look the same. So you have a few or uh, a, a group of Sephardic Jews that came down and had children here as well. And that's from the book Jews of the Amazon by Ariel Segal, page 146. Now, Angola. Now, we're not going to forget about Africa again. Like I said, the 12 tribes chart does need some tinkering and reconfiguration. We need to include Angola when we're talking about Asher. And this is why. That is why we had the idea of starting some sort of work that local blacks could identify with because they are Ang Angola blacks. Now, this would necessarily create identification with the indigenous peoples. Angola Condomble produced a sort of union with the indigenous. And that's exactly what we're getting back to. We're taking these people that are West African, Indian, and we're creating a union. Why? Because we have similar roots. We are Israelites. In Angola Condomble, you can see both African Orishas and indigenous Caboclos. Source, an earth-colored sea by Miguel, Miguel Valle de Almeida. Page 23. So we have the source right there showing you that these West African blacks and these indigenous people looked at each other's culture and say, wait a minute, this is a lot similar. We're dealing with a lot of similar things in our culture. That's why when I read earlier about the native blacks and how their customs can be traced to Africa, well, you got these Angolan blacks that moved to Brazil, that were well, not moved or forced to go to Brazil in slavery. We know the history. They was like, wait a minute, these Indians have the same culture as us. They're the same people. They are the tribe of Asher. Proverbs 20, verse 24. Men's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? So the Lord had the Angolians go to Brazil in mass because they were Asher and the Brazilian Indians were Asher. 
Next slide. Now I want to address the maritime capabilities of these native Indians because a lot of scientific racism has said, oh, these Indians were savages. They couldn't do anything, but they had civilizations, mountains and temples. Um, they could cultivate all the land, right? Build cities on water, build cities on high, high mountains, high altitudes, but they're, they're savages. That's explain the maritime prowess that these people possess. As regards to Native Americans reaching Iberia before recorded history, it is interesting to note that two probable Amazonian Brazilian ground stone hand axes have been found in Galicia. Galicia. Now, Galicia is in Spain. One was found on the beach of Lapamon, San Martino de Buol Ponte Vedra, at the edge of the sand, also in Spain. The other was located at Io in a nearby area, Congas, at Ponte Vedra. Also near the Atlantic coast, after careful examination, Ramon Febregas Valcarce is of the opinion they are definitely not Iberian or Oriental, Oriental, and they, and that they very closely resemble examples of Brazilian axes. Source: The American Discovery of Europe by Jack Ford, page ninety-nine, and I highly recommend you get this book because it also goes into the slave trade of native indians that has neglected in mainstream history where millions and millions of indians were sold in slavery via slave ships some would go to different parts of the caribbean isles some would go to brazil some would go to africa some would go to spain lisbon portugal all over europe all over the mediterranean coast they were being sold but this proves that they had a navy, a, a naval power, that they were maritime, that they were able to, to traverse the oceans. Because why, why else would you find these axes in, in Spain? More proof that these people were maritime. Again, I'm, made, I'm, I'm giving more, more to this tribal breakdown. We're not going to give you bare bones. We're going to give you a full course meal. It says it is at a point that Cologne goes on to describe his directly witnessing the arrival of two Americans in Galway, Ireland, in circa 1477 as, the, as a discussion, as a discussion, chapter one. People from Cantayo towards the east, they came. We saw many notable things, and especially in Galway, Ireland, of a man and a wife of marvelous form with two dugout logs in their possession. Now, this is obviously canoes or the native Indian style boats. Columbus knew that the Atlantic could be traversed before he came over in 1492. Don't follow that mainstream stream farce. He knew, he had it recorded that people had traversed in two dugout logs, and, logs over into where? Galway, Ireland in 1477. This is in his written records. The truth is right before your eyes. The source, The American Discovery of Europe by Jack Forbes, page 120 to 121. I highly advise you get this book. Uh, it says, that is the author, Silvis says that the Northern Ocean is not congealed nor in, in navigable, navigable. Because some people teach, oh, you can't navigate the Northern Ocean. The East Forest is unknown. However, the ancients claim that someone has navigated there. Marian states in Lonely Voyagers in the Middle Ages there arrived one day on the coast of Spain a man rogue and strange and in, in, in a craft described as a hollow tree, another canoe like boat coming to the coast of Spain. Hmm, I wonder where he came from. America. Why? Because they were maritime people. You have to be maritime to establish trade. By sea, okay, and we know the Brazilians were doing it. The Brazilian Indians were doing it along the Amazon and around the country, even with the Mayans. That's recorded history. How were they doing it? Because they were maritime. They were able to traverse the oceans. From the recorded description, which specifically says that he was not a Negro, meaning he wasn't a you know African or African descent, he might well have been a native of America in a Paraguay. A dugout boat, or what you would call a canoe. 
This is history. This is recorded history. And remember, Syl Sylvia says, the ancients claim someone has navigated there. We're going to get into that. What is that there that's talking about America? The vanished glories of the north. It is not surprising then to find Nahum Slush claiming there are indications in the Bible as well as in the works of ancient writers in the Phoenician and in Phoenician's inscriptions discovered from time to time that number numbers of Hebrew settlers or slaves followed the Phoenicians in the excursions across the Mediterranean. And again, inscriptions indicate that certain tribes of Asher and of Zabulon lived in Carthage ever since the foundation of the city. Now, this is a breakdown of Asher, so we're going to focus on Asher, right? They were in Carthage. And finally, we have seen that in all probability there were in Carthage and its dependents large numbers of Jews who followed the Phoenicians into Africa. And this local tradition is in agreement with certain historical indications while the manners and customs of the Jews of Tunis still give evidence of their ancient origin. There is not the slightest doubt that the Jew has persisted in these parts from the Roman epoch to our own times. Hebrewisms of West Africa by Joseph J. Williams, page 189. So we establishing what? That the tribes of Asher and Zabulon was in Carthage. Let's show you how they got to America. Don't worry. Diodorus Siculus says that some Phoenicians were cast upon a most fertile island opposite to Africa. Hmm, I wonder what's opposite to Africa. Oh yeah, the Americas. Of this, he says, they kept the most studied secrecy, which was doubtless occasioned by their jealousy of the advantage the discovery might be to the neighboring nations, and which they wished to secure wholly to themselves. Really, they wanted to keep it away from the Sidonians, the, the actual Hamites. Let you know who are these Carthaginians or Phoenicians that we're referring to. Israelites. There's even another history where they, where they say Neptune and his ten sons discovered an island in the Atlantic. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Ten sons. And they call them Neptune because of reference of the God. Hmm. The Israelites. How about the ten tribes? It says, Diodorus Seculus lived about 100 years before Christ. Islands lying west of Europe and Africa are certainly mentioned by Homer and Horace. They were called Atlantides and were supposed to be about 10,000 furlongs from Africa. Here's this is the po poet's fabled Elysian Fields, but to be more particular with Diodorus, we will let him speak for himself. After having passed in the islands which lie beyond the Herculean Strait, we will speak of those which lie much farther into the ocean towards Africa and to the west of it is an immense island in the broad sea many days sail from Libya its soil is very fertile so this is talking about a huge land where else this could be Cuba this could be Brazil they knew about America in, in the ancient days its soil is very fertile and its surface is variegated with mountains and valleys its coasts are indented with many navigable, ri navigable rivers and its fields are well cultivated Delicious gardens and various kinds of plants and trees. He finally sets it down as the finest country known, where the inhabitants have spacious dwellings and everything in the greatest plenty. To say the least of this account, Diodorus, it corresponds very well with that given of the Mexicans when the first known to the Spaniards, but perhaps it will compare as well as the Canaries. This is from the biography and the history of the Indians of North America, page 5. Diodorus Seculis wrote about the discovery of America about 2,000 years prior to Columbus. And those Carthaginians, those Asherites and Zebulonites, they are the ones who came along. So you can make the correlation. Final slide. We can see the 10 tribes. Uh, 2nd Ezra 13, 40 and 48. The infamous scriptures. A lot of people love to hate these scriptures. Because they, pr they prove and exemplify that the native Indians are Israelites. It says, those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Osea the king, whom Solomon saw, the king of Assyria led away captive. And he carried them over the waters, and so came they into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves, that they would lead the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where, where never mankind dwelt. This is America. That's what Deuteronomy 33 was exemplifying. America. 
that they might keep their keep their statues, which they never kept in their own line on land. That was the intent, not the result. And they entered into Euphrates by the narrow place of the river. So if they entered Euphrates, let you know they traversed it with boats. Now you got some people, oh, they walked across. No, they would traverse it with boats, with boats, with ships. That that is what how the Assyrians and the Medes got down. They took boats up the Euphrates River. They made the Zidonians build them boats, and they would traverse this uh, the Euphrates and the Tigris with boats. That's an ancient practice. I don't know why. What brothers are studying? Maybe they're not studying. They would take slaves up the boat with the boats and drop them off along the rivers to the different ports. We took that same practice and we fled on boats. It said, and they entered into Euphrates by the narrow places of the river, the docking, right? For the Most High then showed signs of them, held still the flood till they were passed over. Passed over what? The sea. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half, in the same region is called Arsif. They went to Arsif, this place where never mankind dwelt, which is the Americas. Then dwelt there until the latter time, and now when they should begin to come. The highest shall stay the springs of the stream again, that they may go through. Therefore saw us down the multitude with peace, but those that be left behind are the people that are found within my borders. So the ten tribes, the remnant of the ten tribes left behind, you, you, see, you hear about them. In the New Testament, you have the sister from Asher, you have the Gadarenes, and so on and so forth. They were still there, because not all of them left. So, what did we go? We we show and prove that these Native Indians descend from a dark-skinned race or a Negroid race. We showed and proved that the names of Asher fit. The uncontacted tribes of Brazil, again, preserved, hidden, cut off. Those are all ad adjectives that can be applied to those uncontacted tribes of Brazil. We even showed you the name Ashir, Ashiri, in a native Indian dialect, the Brazilian dialect. Quechua, right? We showed you that, Quechua. We showed you that the teaching of Indians, Native Indians or the indigenous people of the Americas being Israelites was being taught long before the One West camp. We showed you as well the proof that these Indians, Native Indians, had maritime powers. They were able to tra traverse the ocean and do trade on the ocean via the ocean, right? Via the ships. We showed you the ancient accounts of these Carth Carthaginians or quote-unquote Phoenicians discovering America by Diodorus Siculus. We showed and proved and demonstrated every point. You know the slogan, Genesis 49, as we say no to vague interpretations and we give thorough breakdowns. So the tribe of Asher has been thoroughly broken down. If you agree or disagree respectfully, comment below, like the video, share on the social media platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Like the video, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet, I appreciate all the love from the subscribers. I think we're like at 830 subscribers. By the end of the year, we, we're hoping to uh, reach that thousand, that thousand subscriber mark. And I'll continue to provide with edification, edifying videos, thorough breakdowns, and answering your questions and the will of the Most High. Again, this has been Genesis 49ers. I pray that this was helpful, insightful, and it opened your mind because I know there's a huge attack being launched on the 12 tribes chart. And again, we know the 12 tribes chart may have flaws, but that's what we're here to reconfigure and tweak and add and subtract even if we have to, so we can get it right. So our people can get a clear glass of water, if you will, and digest this information rightfully. Genesis 49ers signing off.